And thanks for letting me have two talks on the same day, as it were, a little one. I'm going to try and make sure that they don't overlap much. Uh, I think part of the reason for that is I fly out tomorrow to another conference. Uh, so in this talk, I want to talk about uh, gaming rigs and machine learning pipelines. It's a little bit of a story of how I transitioned from a long career in open source and cloud computing into kind of just tinkering with machine learning. Um, and I also want to talk about why open source is important. One big thing, though, this talk is interactive. I'm going to ask questions at, at a few points. Don't raise a hand. Just shout out the answers to me. It's fine. Uh, it's a small group. Um, so does anyone remember this character from games? And kind of dating myself here. Um, how about, how about, oops, nope. Uh, this talk goes in two directions. There we go. How about now? Um, so I got started with games back in the late 90s, modding this game um, with you know, two SLI GPUs with 64 megabytes of RAM, which was really cutting edge back then, um, I mean, for a gamer. Um, and that landed me my first job in tech, and you know, fast forward to now. But back then, yeah, uh-huh, um, I can use this meme. We can all use memes because of a thing called fair use licensing. Uh, the equivalent in software is called open source licensing. There's different open source licenses and different reasons why companies choose to open source parts of their products or parts of their technology. Uh, Richard Stallman, one of the sort of um, progenitors of open source as we know it today, once said that sharing your source code is an act of friendship. I view it as an ethical responsibility to share our tools. We all move faster together to build uh, a future to build technology, to build humanity, when we share our tools. And I'm not advocating giving away your business's private anything. You build a better screwdriver, that isn't really part of your core business value. But think about what happens when you share that screwdriver. Someone else might build something that you didn't want to build with that tool. So, uh, no, this way. Um, who here plays role-playing games? Anybody? Any gamers in the audience? I see a bunch of hands. Great. Um, over the years, I've played a bunch of different types of characters. I think it's really valuable games, whether it's tabletop or computer, to get to explore the world from different pr perspectives and ourselves from different perspectives. Um, but gaming isn't all, uh, you know, happy all the time. I stopped online gaming in about 2010. I never really stopped following the community. In about 2014, something happened. Uh, I'll call it the Gamergate controversy. I'm not going to talk much about it, uh, just to say that the, the term doxing came into the spotlight. Uh, and that is the act of de-anonymizing someone from online and hostilely sharing their personal information. Um, it, at the time, it was mostly contained to a little corner of the net. But today, in politics, we're seeing these tactics widespread, in widespread use. They're influencing a lot of people and affecting a lot of people. And, uh, two years after Gamergate, uh, anyone recognize this? It's a, it's a Twitter profile picture. My mouse cursor out of the way. Um, from about 2016. Anybody? Shout out a name if you know what it is. Yes. Microsoft's chatbot. Um, their attempt at PR expressing uh, you know, the usefulness of machine learning online through something cute. Well, it, it used a reinforcement learning technique that learned from the internet. Um, <laughs> Y'all chuckle now, but at the time they didn't really, they should have known better, but they didn't. Um, I was never an employee there, so I can talk about it. Uh, <laughs> now imagine the tools that made this. Imagine if everyone has those tools. What does our society look like when every single person has the ability to build their own chatbot that learns from other humans, other chatbots, or that person? So this talk is supposed to be about machine learning. It's also awesome. I'm going to do that now. Um, in about 2018, I'd left the, the big open source projects I was working on. I took a break from tech for a bit, did some camping, let it get into machine learning, um, kind of like I was a student again. And so I bought a book. It came pretty well recommended to me. If those of you who uh, haven't read this, I, I really recommend this. It's been the, the, the sort of key to me learning deep learning. Um, it presents a really theoretical framework. Uh, chapter two, in particular, is a review of linear algebra. Now, I did some physics and math in college, but I don't have a PhD. Uh, I'm not a theoretical mathematician. I kind of stopped at around differential equations, 
Yeah. Top of high school, maybe a little bit past high school algebra, uh, calculus. Um, if you're just getting into this, I really recommend brushing up on calculus and linear algebra uh, before jumping into the theory of machine learning, but that's really all you need. Like, it's not much more than that. So, uh, armed with a book and uh, trail mix and a hiking pack, I went for a hike up to the mountains and I read it. Um, at this point in the talk, I want to ask, who wants a review of math or, or to skip the math and go to demos? Math, math, math? Okay, cool. So, really what you need uh, is an understanding of these primitives. Scalars, vectors, and tensors. A scalar is just a, a fancy way of saying a single fixed number. Uh, a vector is two of those. It represents a point in space, you know, x, y axis, or something like that. A tensor is a vector of more than two dimensions. It could be three dimensions, it could be 300 dimensions. When everyone else today has been talking about features, uh, getting the right features, feature extraction, using more features, what that translates to in mathematical terms is a tensor. Every feature represents one axis in your tensor. Every individual tensor represents a data point. Uh, a person or uh, a movie in Netflix, whatever it is, that's represented to the machine learning as a tensor. Now, rate is just a rate of change. Like You're driving a car, you're accelerating. You, that's your velocity. Your limit might be as fast as you can push that car to. Um, and that, that's the, the derivative of a curve. Uh, and a maxima, this is what you look for as people talk about fitting or optimizing their training, getting a model that gets 99% accuracy. They're looking for the maxima uh, of, of all the possible weights in their model to predict what the tensor values will be. Um, and then I'll get into what nonlinear functions are in a second. So here's a little visualization of, of limits. And what I want you to think about is this is a three-dimensional space. You've got a local minima at this point here, between the, on this curve. It's a local minima. It's also a local maxima on a different axis. Now, if you have a, a if you've defined a feature space with 300 different features, you're probably not going to find a single global minima or maxima at all because of this kind of curvature. You're going to find lots of local minima, and you might do some feature pruning, where you, you sort of look at some features and say, well, that one's too noisy, cut the feature off my data set. You might do some data pruning and say, well, this data doesn't fit my curve well, so I'm going to ignore it. And, and sort of the goal is to get to collapse to a global approximate minima or maxima um, that, that can represent the best predictive behavior of your, uh, your, your data set. And in the middle of all of this, there are various mathematical functions. I'm only going to demonstrate a convolution. It's probably the most common one, certainly in vision recognition, because uh, this is a pretty easy way to see it. Um, and those of you who've ever used Photoshop might recognize this. I've got a, a you know, an edge detection convolution that looks at the, the uh, sort of takes a single pixel, multiplies the pixel to the left of it by minus one, pixel to the right by plus one, I can detect edges. Um, if you've got a uh, neural network that's doing image recognition, and you look at the hidden layers, you'll find a lot of these kinds of things emerge from it in deep learning. Um, one, some layer might be a left edge, some layer might be a right edge, but it'll, it'll sort of emerge in there. Now, what does a layer look like? Or a neural network, very simplistically, you have inputs and outputs. Outputs determine uh, what kinds of things it can do, dogs or cats. Um, and then hidden layers store the state, and then the connections are different functions, like a convolution or a soft max or a pool. And so I learned all of this from that book and doing a little bit of reading online and looking at some of the frameworks that are out there. Um, and lots of things said, build your own model, here's how to build a model. Lots of the talks today are like, so we designed a model. Well, a lot of the libraries out there already have models because folks with PhDs that are really smart and lots of money and budgets and big companies have published papers and describe these. And you can just pull this off the shelf and use it and it's probably good for the thing you need. Not always. Um, and the numbers represent different sizes or different complexities of those networks. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, these are just the vision ones from um, Torch Vision. There's different types of networks for different uh, functional domains like natural language processing. Don't use these for NLP. Um, let's see. 
So here's an example of a real network that starts with a tensor that's 224 by 224 by 3 RGB channels, performs a lot of functions, condenses it down, and this, uh, the VGG16, can give me up to 1,000 different differentiations in its output. Not just cat or dog, but what type of dog, uh, or what type of fruit, or whatever it is. And so I was tinkering with all of this and trying to build my own network and trying to use these, and, and it took a long time to train them to do anything. Um, all right, kind of jumped ahead there. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then I realized they come pre-trained, which, which really means that someone else with a lot of computing power took a huge data set and did this already, and all I have to do is tweak that last layer. The, the technique is known as transfer learning. It says that an image recognition network that has been trained on a sufficiently broad set of images, all of that stuff is good at detecting the features or extracting features for you. You don't have to define that. Um, if you want to customize it to your specific image domain, you really just modify the end of it, which might be the very last layer or the last couple layers. Training that is really fast. So with all of these ideas in my head, um, I signed up for a bunch of online courses, read a bunch of things. I really highly recommend Fast AI. I'm going to demo it in a bit. I'm watching my clock, so I have time to do that. Um, I really have barely written anything in TensorFlow or Keras at this point. Um, but all of these talk about you know, their walkthroughs, their demos, their classes, doing it on a cloud online. I used to build clouds, so I thought to myself, well, what, what would it take to build my own cloud to do machine learning? looked up the compatibility matrix, and I thought, wow, that's all I need to build a gaming computer. I haven't done that in a while. I'm going to build a gaming computer. Because moving from what's known to what's unknown gives me comfort, gives me a sense of um, security in building something and taking risk. It's not completely unknown. So I bought a bunch of stuff. And if anyone here is a gamer and builds your own stuff, you might be like, ah, me too. Um, I put it all in a, in a case and hooked up a water cooler and turned it on and it glows. Um, and I can kind of see it changing color when it's doing a bunch of model training because it gets hot and the lights are programmed to turn red when the CPU temperature is high. And it's kind of nice. It, I feel good seeing my training happen. I can touch it. It's real. It's not just in a cloud somewhere. Uh, specs, if anyone cares, it's not super high end. It's just like, you know, $2,000, your standard gaming computer at home. So I have that, and then what? Because if you're, if you're doing this, everyone else so far has been talking as a big company with all their prop, uh, proprietary data. And if you're just kind of a gamer at home or independent or want to learn this, you don't have the proprietary data. But there's public data, and that's really where I get into my talk. Um, I'm going to do a quick demo of a chat because the first public data set I used was uh, the complete works of Shakespeare. Um, oh no, okay, hang on. This should work. Yes, okay. So I've got all of my Shakespearean stuff in a text file. Training, I load it into a CSV with pandas. I can visualize it, it's real simple, it's just like a line of Shakespeare. Um, I build what they call a language model data bunch. This is the FastAI framework in a Jupyter Notebook. I do, 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 visualize it again. It's done some um, marking up of it. That's what these XX things are. And I do a basic training. I find the optimal learning rate. And this is like, how, how quickly will I allow the language model to vary over time as I'm training it? I do some training, I kind of iterate through this for a little while until the model stops getting better, my accuracy doesn't improve. I really haven't done much cleaning up of the data here. If I wanted to get a better accuracy, I'd go back to my text file and remove the crap. Um, but at the end of it, doo -doo -doo, I can view the results and I can do some predictions. So, um, you know, once upon a time, my chatbot says, uh, I dare not steal my time, the little live too dear. Anyone want to shout a phrase at me? Like, let the chatbot respond to you in real time. Shout something at me. Let's see what it says. The stay, tis no doubt. 
<laughs> what monster blows <laughs> was to our enemy. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's silly, it's, it's fun, uh, but it's that simple. Like this one workbook, I could now hook this up to Twitter if I wanted to, and it can respond to people. It's really simple. Um, anyone can do it on a laptop if it's got a GPU, on a desktop at home if it has a GPU. It's that simple. So, with that kind of in mind, I went on to look at what big data sets are out there. And there's a bunch. Kaggle, you probably all heard of. It's sort of a competition and aggregates these. Google Cloud actually has, as a public service, huge data sets. Some are available through BigQuery. We kind of paid access to them. Some are just up there. You can download them. Um, and then there's the raw data, which you can get from data.gov, uh, MTBS. I ended up using that for a project called Firewise. And this was the lightning talk I gave last year. Uh, the premise was, could we combine MTBS, that's the uh, Monitoring Trends in Burn Severity national data set, with Landsat uh, geospatial imagery, could we put these together and predict where wildfires will happen? We've got, you know, models, image recognition already pre-trained, two big public data sets, correlate them, see what we can get. Um, and about five people got together and hacked on this for a little while. We ended up not getting it to where we wanted it, uh, but if anyone wants to work on it, I'm happy to, the, the source code's all open. Um, what I want to show you, though, is how we built a scalable learning pipeline without using a cloud. We eventually did, but the approach is sort of the kitchen sink. I didn't know at the beginning of this project what language framework I was going to use. Was it going to be Keras or someone else knew TensorFlow? Uh, was I going to pull in fast AI? I don't know. So I built a Docker, a Docker file, I built a Docker image that just combined all of those together in one and launched a Jupyter Notebook. Our data scientists could use it, I could use it, and then I could push it up to Amazon or Google and scale it out when we needed to. Eventually, we could shrink that down from, it was originally 10 gigabytes, a huge Docker image, down to less than one. Um, in every piece of, of code we wrote, we added a flag, usually a global, sometimes a, a class variable, to, to determine where the data was saved and read from, a local uh, disk or S3. Um, think about your batch processing size if you're doing this, right? A, a computer at my house, my computer at home, has a much smaller amount of both RAM and GPU memory than uh, a rented instance, uh, I think it's P2 extra large in Amazon, it's much bigger. So that can handle a bigger batch process. Make sure that's configurable as you're thinking about this. And then whatever your problem space is, think about how you can divide it up into different batches. So with that stuff in mind, we all kind of brainstormed on it and I built a yeah, Docker image that takes about an hour and a half to build right now. It's really slow uh, and it's really big and I don't recommend that for long. It's a good prototype. Run it, it runs, get a Jupyter Notebook, like the one I showed you. Um, and what, what really helped here was, I, it was the same development environment for every developer on the team, whether they were running it on their laptop or in a cloud, it didn't matter. That was the key to using NVIDIA Docker. So, our process, I said divide and conquer. Um, we decided to use two different stages, a pre-processing pipeline that could be highly parallelized um, that would take a set of parameters we define in YAML. Uh, the parameters might be tile size, batch size, year, and spectrum. Collect all the, or collate all the data that I mentioned, chop it up into little pieces, annotate it, separate, uh, has fire, no fire, training, test data, all of that, and zip it up and store it in S3. And all that's a loop. <coughs> and we could define lots of different search parameters and run a bunch of those in parallel. The second batch process, the actual training. We didn't know what model would work and we didn't know what pre-processing would work. So the second loop is define our neural network model. Define which batch to use and try running that. We threw several thousands of dollars at AWS in, in costs to do all of this. And then about that point, we gave up, right? We didn't, I, my guess is we didn't have the data scientists in our little group who could build a new type of neural network. I think we would need an LSTM plus vision. 
It is something that can do memory over a series of matrices of images. And I don't know how to build that. If someone, wants, someone knows how and wants to help me, I want all this to go public and just be shared for the common good. Talk to me after this. Do you want to see our code? I can do a little quick walkthrough. I've got about eight minutes left. Yes, no? Yes? OK. Do, do, do. So first batch process, um, we use the GDAL library. Uh, I pre-downloaded the file. It's this big file. It's about you know, 500 megabytes. It's a shape file. And you can sp slice that up into uh, per year or per year range, and then visualize each of those as a, from a TIFF file. Looks awfully like that. You can kind of see the outline of the, of the US West Coast there. That's all the, uh, the fire data for the year 2000 across the US. That's kind of the output of our first batch process. Um, and then the second one, I'm not going to run these right now because it's going to take way too long. Um, do -do -do, combines all of that and fetches. Um, long list was one of the outputs of the first batch process. Combines it all from Google. Uh, this is one of those data sources that is not metered. You can just go download it. It's also huge. It's petabytes. Don't download it. <laughs> Search it, right? Um, the, the URL is programmatic. So we just define what's, what area we're going to search and go grab those as needed. Um, pick some at random for our training set. I can, I can just print a few here and then start running through. Ignore all the failures. Um, and then plot some of the results. If any errors, we get that. Uh, we can kind of visualize in a grayscale because uh, this is actually near infrared spectrum, um, each location. And um, this should have been showing uh, like cloud cover percentages. A lot of the data can actually tell you what percent cloud cover should you discard it, um, intersect with the fire data, discard it or keep it. Um, but it's, it's not actually that much code to run through each batch. We've got a library separate from this that um, sort of abstracts the differences between Amazon or local uh, and, and where to pull the data from. Um, oops, ah, no, wrong window. There we go. Okay. So I want to point out that you get what you measure. In this case, but, but not always, because your model also has to work for that domain of data. Um, do, do, do. Sorry, I chopped up my talk. I want to actually show you a second chat demo. Yeah, so I think that was a missing slide. Sorry. Um, I wanted to show a second chat demo here. And ask folks to shout out a few more words at me. This one converged a little faster. Um, shout out some more words at me. Go on. Pick a phrase. Hmm? Just do it. Must be concerned about a great leadership. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Try again. Sorry? Do we say to the God? Oh, wow. Nor be clearly who must doubt as you would have love it was in here. <laughs> this doesn't sound like Shakespeare anymore. <laughs> um, so what do you think I changed? The input. Yeah, this is actually exactly the same uh, model network and training process as my first chatbot. Um, it's really the wrong love. <laughs> um, I trained this one instead of on Shakespeare on MLK, another public data set. So I want you all to really think about whether you're doing fire data or you're pulling down public genomic data or taxi data. 
that you get what you measure, and if you put something that has bias in, you get bias out. Some of the things in our, our um, search for predicting fire, we were not able to get to, is analyzing, uh, um, sorry, extracting uh, objects, roads, cars, buildings. We weren't considering any of that. But humans have a massive impact, actually the, the most frequent cause of wildfires. So uh, really think about the data, what it represents, who it represents. As you're cleaning it or removing features or removing data points, who does that feature represent? Who does that outlier represent that you're choosing to remove from your data set to get a model to converge? I don't think that we, the, the fact that we couldn't get the model to converge and predict fire doesn't mean necessarily that we failed, that we didn't get what we wanted. We learned a lot about how to build pipelines and what kinds of things you need to put in to them. So when you're consuming, because a lot of us now, a lot of companies now are publishing the results of their trained models through web services. Uh, this is just one simple example. Google sentiment analysis, and they're, they're pushing this a lot as a business to get people to subscribe to it and, and integrate it in their own products. You don't know who put, or what, data, what training data was put into that model. You don't know whose bias is in it when you're using it. I think the industry as a whole is kind of stuck right now, trying to solve this problem. And I don't have an answer. Um, we ended up not pursuing the Firewise project even further because I didn't want to be responsible for someone's um, home insurance getting canceled. When the insurance company says, wow, we think there's going to be a fire there, that, sure, it's, a good, it's valid business, but I don't want to be personally responsible for that, and I would feel that way. So please think about personal data as private property. It's not a corporate right. The differential privacy talk was amazing. That's really going to help, but I don't think it's enough. I'd like to see the model trained on my data be considered my own property, living on my device and nowhere else, representing my views on the world, not someone else's bias. I hope you'll all help me get there. Thank you. <laughs>